Well, hello again. Um, so thank you so much for filling in the poll. I'm sorry I can't show it to you, although I can, I can waggle my laptop in your direction. So we've had 59 responses. Um, we have one person who feels that forestry is a, has voted for a threat. We've had six voting for opportunities, um, 12 saying both, but more of a threat. 13, but, but saying more of an opportunity, 21 saying an equal measure, and then um, two saying neither, three don't know, and one not sure. So there's some, there's some positivity in the room, I think we can say from, from that, thinking about opportunities. Um, shall, we, shall we, having got through that, shall we move on to the discussion? Okay, so as I say, we're, what we're going to do now is just have a bit of a ramble chat and a, a structured ramble chat. But we've got some themes within themes, and the two themes are threats and opportunities. But um, we, we've briefed our fantastic panel, and I'll introduce them in a second, with regards to what we want to talk about and we, what we want to give them a chance to, to talk about and share. Um, but as I said at the start, what, we, what we're really keen to do is make this a, a three-way conversation so as I say at any point if you've got an inter interjection or a thought then please raise your hand and um, and join us in the discussion but um, what we've wanted to do is provide a, a bit of a breadth of um, experiences and um, positions and and um, stances with regards to forestry and the historic environment so first of all we've got Jill Bulland who is uh, Natural Resources Wales and very much coming at it from would you say is it fair to say a landscape perspective Lastly, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, so, yeah, but very much looking at woodland creation as well, and and so that. Um, Sarah Poppy, who's Historic England, and very much around policy advice, rural environment. Absolutely, yes. And my role is really sort of policy advice for for heritage and a sort of rural context. So liaising a lot with DEFRA and its delivery bodies, but also how Historic England engages with the processes around woodland creation and everything to make sure that we're getting the best outcomes for our designated assets. Um, and Matt Ritchie, um, who's Forestry and Land at Scotland. Um, I'd, I'd argue my counterpart, but also you cross over into the dark side a little bit, but I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, so I work entirely on the National Forest Estate, which is around about 9% of Scotland, uh, providing advice and guidance in relation to, to protection, conservation and presentation of the historic environment. I take it's the presentation bit that is the dark side. I was thinking policy and advice. Well, policy and advice. <laughs> and finally, Chris Chuso, who's my colleague at Forestry England, um, who works in our East District as a historic environment. So I'm working on the um, the public forest estates, so rather than woodland creation, and I provide a voice. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Right, as I say, so I've, I've got a few things, so pointers and steers with regards to what we're going to be talking about today. And... Um, I guess I'm going to kick us off, Matt, with threats, and I'm going to come to you for this, if that's okay. And it's, it's, it's a simple question, but maybe not a simple question. But with regards to threats, do you think the traditional views with regards to the impact of forestry on the historic environment are fair? And by traditional, I mean going in, planting trees in completely the wrong place, changing the aesthetic, sticking a massive conifer plantation in, in a British landscape, um, and... Uh, deep ploughing and all the other uh, the large vehicles that come in and it tear up the ground ahead of clearance. Is, is that an accurate representation? Uh, yes, it is. Um, so when um, David talked of forestry being the most heavily regulated industry in the UK, I did raise an eyebrow. Um, EIAs, I think we'll agree, are very rarely used. They usually get put straight, put straight through scoping. Um, and it's really the role of the UKFS that we're looking at. Um, it's unmonitored. And indeed, the only real thing that um, our forestry colleagues are regulated on is felling, restocking and harvesting. And everything else within the UKFS and within the forest design plan is basically aspirational. So the question is, how do we, how do we meet our aspirations of caring and protecting and presenting the historic environment uh, within that fairly um, 
traditional uh, mindset. So I think the, the role of net zero in forestry and meeting net zero and climate change is, is really fair. It's really important. Um, it may well be whether it's um, productive conifer or, um, uh, or native woodland, uh, we're still aiming to lock up timber and it, uh, lock up carbon. And then the, the, possibly the most important thing is not importing it from anywhere else because that is creating a lot of carbon in terms of transport and it's basically just offsetting the problem to somebody else. So it is coming. We are going to be planting more trees and it's about trying to make sure that it's the right tree in the right place because as we all know, root damage, harvesting vehicles, timber lorries, timber road building is inherently damaging to archaeology. Uh, so just staying with you for a second, then, Matt, with regards to identifying the right tree in the right place and um, accounting for those threats, um, what would be a standard way of approaching that? I th the most important thing for me is that we get the information correct at, at the right time. So it's before woodland establishment. So there's the, there is obviously there's uh, reflecting back on this morning's fascinating discussion. We have um, th three, I suppose, maybe four uh, different scales of, of uh, impact um, from the uh, habitat or forestry management uh, through to habitat. Uh, or forestry restoration, woodland restoration, where you're trying, you're, there's going to be more Im impact in that, uh, and then actually habitat or, or forestry creation, uh, where you're, you're, you really are impacting upon the land, um, and so almost splitting that apart, which we have done in terms of threats and opportunities, uh, focusing on that woodland creation aspect. Uh, before a tree is planted uh, means that as archaeologists it's about getting the right information at the right time in the right way so a, a really good walkover survey well presented uh, using the language of the UKFS in terms of uh, cultural heritage significant heritage features talking about value and significance pointing out opportunities um, but it, it's also very much about um, making sure the information for the uh, um, from the local authorities is, is, is good. So it's about polygonized data um, and, and, and making sure that we can, we're really going to be able to help uh, the forest planner with, with detailed spatial information. Brilliant. I, I might bring Sarah in then to follow up from there with regards to from... Uh, it, yeah, oh, no, I was coming to you last I promise. Yeah, what, what do you make of all this? Absolutely, and I think that's the, the, the fundamentally crucial thing is that what, what we're facing is a massive challenge for our sector and how we respond to you know, this, the climate emergency and the need to, to, to address net zero. And the provision of information and kind of making sure that up front we're clear about where unsuitable areas are, where opportunities exist, is, is really important. And in, in England, for example, they've just changed to how consultation happens. And a lot of the, the onus is very much now on applicants to acquire that information and to present it and to integrate it into their plans rather than us constantly um, entering into it blindsided on heritage and us having to then start the, the negotiations then. So I think that, that having good quality information available to people who are ultimately planning these, um, these, these interventions is, is fundamental. And, and so, Krisha, from your perspective then, as, from, as a land manager and... Um... That's someone that's also looking, we're expanding our estate as well, so looking at creation and also management of established forests. What would you say some of the biggest threats you see to the archaeological record that sits in, in our forests or that, that could be? Now, as you were talking about um, the effects of uh, forestry operations, but I think there's not enough emphasis on the problems caused by ground preparation before restocking. And there seems to be a real effort to emphasis or has been a real emphasis on the harvesting operations and I don't think there's enough on sort of like the effects of scarification for example the enormous damage that can cause I've seen sort of examples where we've got well-preserved archaeology in one area and it say in Friston Forest down in East Sussex and then um, what appeared at first on Lydor to be um, another part of a prehistoric field system which when I went down there the forest went no, I'd call that by scarification. Like it's like, oh, and you're just telling me this. <laughs> you, you're not even worried about it. <laughs> go. After he was just telling me how interesting heritage he was. So that's a, a bit of an issue, I'd <laughs> say. So. Uh, uh, that's interesting. I'd like to come back to that in a minute. But 
what, what's interesting about the themes that are coming through here is about getting good data and the threats of impact and poorly informed decisions or um, just activities taking on place on the ground. But one thing we get a lot within the within pushback in a lot with regards to forests and trees is the impact of roots. And I know in the audience we've got Arwen Cooper, who's recently been doing some work with Oxford Archaeology, looking at root impacts. So I wonder if I might put you on the spot and ask you to update us on how roots interact with our archaeology. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to say that much. <laughs> but um, yes, we've been working uh, with a set of colleagues at Oxford Archaeology with the Forestry Commission, um, looking at uh, directly at the relationship between tree roots and archaeology. And we sort of put the emphasis on relationship rather than impact because we wanted to be open minded from the start. We didn't want it all to be about threat and damage. Um, so we started out by sort of pulling together all the available literature there was um, about the relationship between tree roots and archaeology. Um, but there was then a stakeholder engagement phase, so you might have received an email. Um, um, we also sort of consulted the HER forum um, for experiences of what happens with tree roots and archaeology. Um, and we actually went to the ADS, which was a sort of, um, we, that wasn't in the plan from the start, but because on a separate project, um, I've been doing sort of cross searches of all the um, archaeology data service holdings. And I've realized how useful it is as a, as a tool for sort of identifying certain things. So we did a cross search on a sort of set of um, search terms like roots. Um, <laughs> Uh, not just damage and, but, but, and that kind of thing. That came up with a whole list of sites where people had mentioned in the sort of initial summary in a report um, of, of the relationship of that tree roots had sort of been a feature of an archaeological investigation. And then we did, conducted interviews with about 20 people, so forestry practitioners, um, heritage uh, practitioners, to go through sort of their experiences of tree roots and archaeology and it's all been really interesting and pardon the pun it could have branched out in many different <laughs> directions it was quite hard to keep the focus just on tree roots and archaeology and not on management of trees as well um, because it's all sort of linked obviously um, but I think um, the findings have been really interesting and um, they should be um, publicly available very soon and I think um, what we realized really through the project is that a lot of um, the decisions that we make now are still very dependent on anecdotal evidence rather than um, evidence of actually knowing what tree roots and archaeology do. Um, and so there's work still to be done and there is actually a follow-up to our initial work. Um, so part of, of, of the project that we've done is to put together a project designed for a ground truthing exercise. Um, and there are there are sort of there is work going on in this area already. So um, one of the case studies that we came across um, was a, an excellent project by um, the National Park in the Peak District, um, where there was a, a, a quarry site um, that had old permissions, um, and they treated each tree. They removed nine hundred trees from um, just beyond a scheduled vicus. Um, and they they treated each tree as a sort of archaeological test pit and looked at how artifacts had moved um, and yeah how much the sort of interpretation of the site had changed. Um, so there's good work going on, but it's still there's still more that needs to be found out. That's it. Thank you very much, Anwin. Appreciate that. I know you've got to pop off to another session in a second, so thank you for your time. Um, so that's the interesting take with regards to the impact of tree roots in a targeted area. I guess one thing that is related to this, but is another step up, is the David's mention of climate change and increased storminess and the impacts of historic plantations in areas perhaps that haven't seen the same level of protect, um, of consideration and inf information um, in advance of their creation, which uh, certainly with Storm Arwen uh, last year, we on our own estate, we saw a substantial amount of, of tree wind wind blow and the impacts that that, that has on um buried archaeology and with it within those areas um jill with regards to then the um the impacts of climate change and ambitions for tree planting and all the other things you have to consider i just wonder if you had any thoughts or elaborations on that 
Yeah, so us in Wales, we have a sector adaptation plan for climate change, which includes different environments, including forestry. And so through that, we are trying to engage as Natural Resources Wales with the archaeological profession to see what those threats and opportunities could be and how that can be managed. And then that can come through onto the estate. So through that, we're sort of looking at you know, as you'd know, some of those threats being pest diseases, too much water, too little water, creating instability and, and wildfires. And, uh, you know, in, in Wales alone, you know, we've all experienced 2018 as being a very dry year. But looking to like the 10 year period of 21, we had 181 wildfires associated with woodlands. And I think those are sort of numerical figures, but as you know, it's, it's the impact on the ground. It's not the statistic that's important. And while sometimes your know, wildfires might reveal new archaeology, fundamentally it's, it's an enormous risk and about fire breaks and the management of those and including them in new woodlands. Um, but obviously we manage that and our work is about resilience of the forests for um, everything within the UKFS obviously including the historic environment and within that then we will try to um, in our uh, forest resource plans looking at restocking um, and planting that will take into account resilience to climate change and the historic environment um, and uh, quite a nice example recently which is Quite, I'll bring this one up because it relates to tree roots um, and uh, a liaison day we had in October where we visited uh, part of the New World Heritage Site in Wales. So the slate quarry at Abergynolwyn, um, Brunegloes Quarry, and there's a stone aqueduct going across with mature conifers. Um, and at present, that really isn't particularly an issue, but with climate change and looking forward into the resilience and the potential for wind throw in that area would be a significant risk to those uh, scheduled, uh, two scheduled monuments, uh, two inclined scheduled monuments. So quite a significant piece of work was undertaken on this sensitive site to take those mature conifers out by um, logging and removal by horse. Um, and so that isn't a risk that's now, but it's, that, it's a known risk that is, is much more likely. So where possible, preemptive action can be taken. Um, and that, that's quite a nice example for your tree roots as well, really. Fantastic, thank you, Joe. Um, Sarah, with regards then to that, that climate change, the climate change impact, the net zero goals, the getting the trees in the grounds, the, the number of figures that David showed with regards to applications and, and growth of, of forests. Um, what's the threat from, uh, I mean, we all love the British landscape and it suddenly it's about to change substantially. Well, absolutely. The, the, the sort of, in some ways, I think the impact on, on the landscape is, is greater um, than you know the physical impact potentially of, of root action. I mean, with uh, the new environmental schemes that are coming out, there are new fundamental. You know, there's, a, there's a government ambition to introduce agroforestry, which is a type of land use that we've seen very, very localized and very specialized up till now. Which, if rolled out on the scale, would you know dramatically um, impact our landscapes. And of course, climate change will also impact our designated historic landscapes in terms of um, the, the, you know, the, the loss of certain species, having to sort of integrate this sort of planning for these landscape, historic landscapes to be sustained. So I think, and that's possibly the harder, harder thing that hasn't been, you know, as, as, as well assessed potentially as the, the impact of, of the root damage. That, yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. Thank you. And you, that, that, that's what I was hoping you'd, you'd go along the lines of. I, know, I, I will throw in that I'm always of the mindset that the landscapes are dynamic. So, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. yeah it's kind of, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, so we're, we're very much involved in, we see, um, come on, the opportunity side, but I'll dip my toe into it now in that there are opportunities to introduce woodland into a landscape that is, um, you know, respecting of, 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 of historic landscape is, is, is sort of, you know, re-establishing past woodlands that have been lost, re-establishing the use of, of, of trees and hedges and this sort of thing where we can actually sort of maintain and enhance landscape character through our, you know, considered interventions rather than, you know, inappropriate planting. That's great. Um, so, um, with regards to that then, with, with, I know David and his team at Forestry Commission have been working on a lot of things linked to large data sets and opportunity mapping and you showed the um, the, the Welsh um, 
website on your slide there. But Matt, going back to some of the comments you mentioned at the start, um, and particularly around data and polygonization of information, I know you've done a lot of stuff work with your estate. Um, why does it matter? What's the, what, what's, why, is, why is that so great? And what, what's the issue with not doing it? Or what's the issue with the current state of play with HERs and et cetera? Um, uh, way back when I first started uh, with FLS, which would be 16 years ago, uh, we had a meeting of the Scottish Forestry Strategy Implementation Plan in regards to historic environment. And the professional foresters who were there, um, to a person, said that the single most important aspect of improving historic environment and information and advice for them was to provide them polygonized spatial data that they could work with rather than simply point to data. Um, and indeed, on the forest estate, we've gone that bit further and we're now beginning to remove uh, point data that is uh, um, archivable, I would say, where, where the find spot is no longer there or it's been destroyed. So it's about uh, creating manage management information rather than a historic environment record. Um, so and trying to enable that, I think, is, 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 a, is a key element of uh, the local authority information and advisory service. Uh, but on the flip side, not to, not to sound too positive, um, it's the UQUAS is the, is the thing that most foresters are most frightened of. They want to retain their UQUAS certification. So that when, a, when an UQUAS auditor comes to you uh, as a stakeholder asking for um, information uh, or comment about the, 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 the thing that they're actually auditing, uh, the key thing is is to is to be helpful to the auditor to, to to pose them questions about that parcel of land or about that company or about that government organisation, but but help them um, interpret Aquas section four point eight. And I'll even help you there, um, and and make sure that the 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 the. the um, the auditor, who is the one that has the real leverage, knows the right questions to ask. Yeah, I just follow on from that, if that's okay, a personal experience. So before I, I did the role I do now for Forestry Commission England, I, I worked for Forestry England in, in the East District. And I think it was my second day in the job, Aquas Inspector came in and grilled me about what I was doing to protect the historic environment in the East District from North Norfolk down to Kent. And that was a very welcome introduction to, to Forestry England. Well, you have the mic. Um, just with regards to, I wonder if you wanted to elaborate on some of the larger data projects that, that you're doing and why, and yeah, what, what, what are the threats that are perceived to, what, to drive those, those projects? Yeah, so in, in Forestry Commission England at the moment, we have what we're calling um, the National Historic Environment data sets for, for woodland creation projects, such a mouthful I, I stumble over it even three years after, after it started. Um, the need for um, improved access to historic environment data in, in England to, to the forestry sector was something that I identified and colleagues identified very, very soon after I took this job on about, about three years ago. And that was partly through what I've been seeing over, over many, many years, the feedback that I was hearing from foresters, but also knowing that a particular group within the forestry sector had the intention to approach DEFRA and say, you have these ambitious tree planting targets, we will not meet, meet them because of archaeology. Um, and I felt we needed to find ways to ward, ward that off. So one way was to say, we're going to develop guidance to help the forestry sector understand archaeology better, how to handle it more effectively. Um, but we're also going to try and improve access to data. And the England Trees Action Plan that I showed you has, a, has an action in it um, with a deadline of this, this month um, to, to improve access to, to historic environment data. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been working with um, Natural England and the Association of Local Government Archaeological Officers to enhance the Shine Heritage data set, the Selected Heritage Inventory for Natural England, to give it wider use beyond agri-environment. What it was originally intended for was agri-environment, but we're widening its use to, to, to woodland creation. Um, we've also been working with another number of companies on artificial intelligence-based data sets. Um, so we've been able to develop a data set of historic woodland from late 
19th century, early 20th century woodland survey maps. We've been able to develop that to identify the woodlands that have been lost. We've been able to um, identify Widgeon Furrow from um, LIDAR data. Um, and we are in the process of um, another project identifying historic parkland from um, historic, historic maps. The idea being that we can have these data sets some of them won't be publicly accessible, but we can add them into either existing Forestry Commission data sets or a historic environment opportunities map like the one in Wales. So people can go online and immediately have access to data that will make them go, do you know what? I really shouldn't, I shouldn't be looking there. That comment that we, we heard in the earlier session where, where you were asked or someone you, you'd said previously, Lawrence, where well, if I was going to start, I wouldn't start. I wouldn't start here. Um, so fingers crossed fingers that's crossed. going to make a, a big difference. But at the same time, Sarah alluded to it, the changes in the consultation process, which put um, the requirement on an applicant to gather information and advice. And that's still to come from historic environment records, from Historic England, from the Gardens Trust and um, other historic environment bodies. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Sarah, I wonder if I might put you in on the spot for a moment. But so I going on around um we we talked we touched on the impacts of forests and trees and forestry work itself. We touched on the impacts of um the right being the right place and the right data. Um but I'd be quite keen to look in a bit at us as a discipline and as professionals. Um, and I think I know, well, I've, I've got an opinion on this, but I'm not going to steer on it too much. I wonder how you feel we are with regards to the knowledge um, in, in terms of pr commercial professional archaeologists and the advice that they're giving people with regards to um, tree management, woodland creation and, and their, their responsibilities, the, the difference it is between UKFS and National Planning Policy Framework, for example. Yes, I think that, that certainly is a... a an issue we've we've identified isn't it i think through going on this journey that 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 people are not people aren't don't have as a good an understanding of the impacts of, of tree planting to be able to give advice that is considered considering the opportunities as long as as well as the the impacts so i think we have tended to um, provide advice assuming that tree planting is equivalent to, to development whereas actually we know some of the, the land uses that are being replaced potentially by tree planting are more harmful than, than tree planting and, um, and, and are not regulated at all, for example, through agriculture. So I think um, there is a need and, you know, it's something that's recognised in the England Tree Action Plan about training and communication with the sector to um, kind of reframe the way in which they engage with these types of consultations to recognize the opportunities um, to provide clear advice to this is a, a, a key thing is we're very used we're very good at sort of hedging our bets and saying we need more evaluation whereas actually in the sort of economies of you know a woodland creation that's often a luxury that can't be afforded so we need to actually be clearer our advice about, about significance and about the importance of, of, of preservation to give a clear steer to woodland creators on, on how to how to proceed. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I will do the same. Um, Jill, if I could just bring you in on that. So if you if you got any thoughts of expanding on that from a Welsh perspective, but also um, just maybe adding on or appending on to that um, issues maybe around resourcing and capacity as well. Yeah, a very pertinent one to us. Um, so in Natural Resources Wales, we don't have an archaeologist in-house. Um, so what we have developed is a memorandum of understanding with CADU and the Archaeological Trusts, now HENEB. And that means that we take advice where we've got that. But what we have also got is, our, is the data set, the historic environment record that you know, we all have. But we've got also our own data sets and own records that aren't in that historic environment record because at the time that they were gathered, perhaps you know, they weren't uh, the, the, the information associated with those records weren't compliant with what they need to be to get into the records. So whilst we've got that in our own GIS um, for constraints mapping, they're not necessarily available to everyone. 
everybody else in the same way. And, and that's a real missed opportunity. And it's a shame. And, it, and it's whilst you know, this is our land holding in the Welsh Government Woodland Estate, um, you know, that's a real resourcing capacity issue to get it into the format that's required. And um, just to give you a, an idea of the, the number of records, so Welsh Government Woodland Estate is uh, 7% of Wales, and we've got about 7,500 historic assets um, identified on that estate. Um, and that was partly from a, a survey done a number of years ago. But since then, we know we've got 460 records that aren't on there. And recently, a colleague, um, he uh, commissioned a contractor to go and visit 25 of those records that aren't in the HER. And they went out and ground truth and you know, did a la, um, and actually found 49. So if we start to think we've got 460 that we haven't got in, we start we can start to multiply that up. Um, and that's going to be an ongoing issue. And so there is nowhere we can turn to for funds to do that. And I'm sure others have that same issue. And, and sometimes I feel that we could be scrabbling for small pots of money as and when the need arises. And perhaps what we need to be is more ambitious and think bigger and to be pushing more for a more national survey or cross-border survey at something that really recognises the, the benefits of bringing much more receivable and much more up-to-date um, because of all of these um, you know, different multifunctional pressures that we've got within this. And, and it all starts with data because it is the, the data that's on the, GI, the, on the GIS or the desk-based that has to go all the way out to the contractor that's perhaps you know, working in the harvester in the field. And, and without that information getting across, they can only do what they can do. And, and and you know perhaps that, that harvester isn't as recognizable to does recognize new historic assets that haven't yet been identified so so I think um, resourcing um, uh, of, of the data is is our evidence and and for myself and many others all our work stems from evidence-based decision making brilliant thank you uh, one final thought Chris if, if you will just from a from a management perspective if you've got anything to add add to that yeah, I totally agree with Joel about the um, the standard of the data that we have that sits in our database, our legacy information that needs an awful lot of improvements. That and that's across the whole country. So within my district, I'm the only dedicated historic environment advisor, but in the other districts, the um, the role is shared between a historic environment advisor one day a week, then they're a forest planner or the recreation or whatever. So I'm the only person just working on heritage. So resources inconsistent across the country. So I do what I can within my district to try and improve the data. And I've started to export that to the NGRs once I've managed to get it up to scratch. So I've start with my own little program <laughs> but yeah so it's but i've got a long way to go and um lawrence you asked me to um, go through the other districts to update their atr data last year which revealed enormous inconsistencies in how often that data had been updated especially sort of like one district i think records didn't seem to have been updated for about 10 years and that's quite horrific when you think, as Jill says, that data is going out to people and they're in a harvester. They're working with a line that's just been buffered. It's not necessarily in quite the right place to start off with and it's buffered, so it's enormous. They're looking out for some enormous heritage feature. There's like nothing they can find on the ground. That, that inaccuracy of data is um, slightly terrifying in places. Thank you, Christian. And thank you all. And it's not all doom and gloom. We are about to go on to um, to positivities and hopefully circle back to some of these things we, we've already said. But before we go on to um, opportunities, I will open the floor up to questions. So I can see Hannah's got her hand up. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that data point and give a shout out to Historic England's NMP programme. So we were recently looking at one of our properties in the southwest of England, half of which had had NMP surveys undertaken, half of which hadn't. And the line down the middle of what we were able to advise and what we weren't with that 
uh, difference in the availability of those data was really striking. Um, HE, if you want to borrow that <laughs> screenshot <laughs> to promote that, but it's there are some really important scaled programs that are making a big difference. However, what we have also found when we have used the presence of those crop mark data to justify quite intensive geophysical survey is that quite often a lot of those features are no longer existing um, when we go and survey them. So um, at the moment, we're trying to pull together data from a number of our properties where we've done that level of intense survey um, to see that the extent to which it's worth that investment in order to then release up places where actually, sadly, those crop mark sites are, or there's no longer any evidence in the ground. But that combination of those two sources of information is proving quite um, valuable. Any other questions or thoughts for the panel? Hi, I'm Helen Winston from uh, Historic England, and I used to run the NMP programme. And uh, so I would just say, again, in terms of data, that is, in terms of harvesting data on a large scale, anybody who works in the Forestry Commission will have worked with LIDAR data, and that's made a massive difference, of course. Um, and Chris has also worked on the aerial survey as well. And again, it's those maps. So it's thinking about threats and opportunities. You know, some of the best preserved archaeology is in woodland in England. You know, we did this incredible survey in the high woods um, in Sussex. And uh, sorry, I've got a terrible cold. Um, and it's just wall to wall archaeology. So again, it's just thinking um, that on the upside as well, that it does protect it. You know, like on military training zones as well, it's it's ploughing that is killing archaeology in at scale in the country. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely agree, and hopefully we'll touch on more on that in the next in the next bit. But yeah. So in this, sorry, Cat Hopwood Lewis, Natural England. Um, in this session, we've been using tree planting as a sort of catch-all for tree establishment. But that's only one of the key methods for creating new woodland, the other being natural regeneration. Um, from my viewpoint, I would see that as having an increased level of scrub, an increased risk of animal burrowing and so forth. How do the forestry professionals in the room see natural regen and how that fits in with the establishment of increased woodland cover? I'm, I'm really glad you raised that, Kat, because I noted that down and then probably didn't raise it. So that, that, that's good. But yes, it is certainly, a, 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 and you know, from a point of view of the uh, Shedron monuments at risk that Historic England gathered, I think unmanaged woodland is the second greatest risk threatening, threatening our Shedron monuments, opposed to um, agriculture being the first, as, as Helen alluded to. But I think this is a, a, a concern that we need to be aware of in that. You know, are we, given the resources that are available, can we maintain? Well, can, 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 can natural regeneration is, you know, will take place. You know, particularly with climate change, it will encourage all manner of natural regeneration on archaeological sites that we're trying to protect in open space, and whether we can sustain that level of, you know, management across the across the piece going forwards. How are we doing for time, David? Do we need to? Maybe last question. Thank you. Um, Christina Kravitz, um, York Archaeology. Um, I just wondered if any of this discussion also extends to wet woodland, or where woodland is encroaching on waterlogged deposits. Um, and I just wondered, obviously, with the threats from routing and things like that within waterlogged contexts, where we might not necessarily know whether we have heritage assets preserved within those deposits and how that is kind of being managed. In most cases, it's not going to be managed. Uh, nat natural regen is uh, almost on a par with invasive native species. Um, it's, it's, you've, you've really got to think about existing habitat management and the resources that have to go into that in terms of smelling regen, ideally on scheduled monuments and the likes. Um, existing habitat restoration, where you're trying to restore either a peatland habitat or perhaps a wetland, wet woodland, where there will be management uh, for restoration of the landscape scale. And new woodland establishment is a very big difference between that existing habitat restoration or management and new woodland creation. And regen's not going to happen 
on new woodland creation because um, you need mature trees for it to happen. So um, it's, it's, not, it's not an issue in, in that regard, but it is an issue in terms of um, uh, the, the health and, and well-being of uh, a wide variety, for a wide variety of habitats, particularly native woodland and wet woodland and the likes. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I think we'll, we'll, we'll try not to look at what's happening in the corner of the room, um, which I, the problem I may well have caused earlier in the, in the day. Apologies. Um, what we'll do is we'll move on to opportunities now. And Helen, you have very much set us up for, for where we're going to start. So thank you very much for that. So um, what we'd like to start talking about is um, preservation of archaeological remains in woodland and in forestry. Um, um, Jill, I wondered if you might be willing to, to start us off on that. Um, I know we had a discussion a, a week or so ago about um, visibility of heritage assets in woodland, for example. I wondered if you might follow on for, for us. Yeah, it's, um, sorry, yeah, it's good to hear that. Um, in, in Wales, obviously, the uh, woodland estates and woodlands are often many of the areas where we have access and, and, and public access which I think we were talking is quite different to the, to the case in Scotland. And so that is a real opportunity for uh, people and the interpretation and visibility of heritage, as well as we have the well-being of future generations in Wales and all the other parts that that goes with um, for well-being. But um, you know, we do have examples. You know, as I said before, we had like our seven and a half thousand assets in woodland. We can't make all of those visible, nor you know, would you want to. Who would you? Know, is, who's going to, to see see and visit those? Um, so it is about you know, protection and management of those. But there are occasions where enhancing the visibility and ac visible accessibility. Um, goes hand in hand with other purposes, whether that's nature recovery, landscape opening, panoramic views, or anything else. Um, so we have got some quite nice examples. There's one, uh, Carn Fleur, which is a cairn, um, where when the uh, felling was done for that, it was taken back, well away from the cairn itself. And when it was replanted, it was planted only halfway up, um, you know, much further, you know, set back further. Um, and then there's a, a regime in place to manage the natural regeneration. Because I think what we would find is, you know, opening up visibility for places, often you end up with a natural regeneration that we, we can't really afford to manage. So sometimes keeping the light levels low is, is possibly a, a better opportunity for that site. Um, but we have other examples where we've... Um, had uh, hut circles that have been protected or made more, more visible um, by the management of that site and again the resource coming in to keep that accessibility um, and, and other areas where we um, come back to the natural regeneration points where we are removing natural regeneration from spoil heaps to uh, maintain the sort of integrity of the spoil heaps um, and the visibility of what they're looking like. We are particularly um, with conifer um, regeneration, that's at Nanti Moch. Um, but also that goes hand in hand back with nature conservation interests, so the, the specialist interests that you might find in uh, spoil heaps. So I think, um, you know, we, to, to, for people to come into our woodlands, they come for different purposes. And you know, whatever that might be, whether it's just simply walking the dog or because they want that green bathing, whatever else. And I think there's always an added enhancement from heritage where you can engage with that. Um, and, and I think it adds value, adds that sense of place as we know. And so where we can you know, combine heritage with the natural environment and those needs, then that, that is that win-win we're looking for. Brilliant, thank you. Can I just check when you're talking about spoil heap, it's spoil heaps, it's spoil from um, mining, 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 from slate mining or, yeah. or coal mining. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah thank you. Um, Krisha, I wondered if you might want to talk about some of the work that you've been doing on um, managing archaeological sites and, and improving their visibility in, um, in, in woodland. Just, um, just referring back to our natural region conversation of earlier on, I've recently been um, working with the beet foresters in the Chilterns to try and work out a, a harvesting programme on quite complicated medieval um, fishery. So uh, the 
site was completely cleared. And as you were saying about the glass sites, once they're cleared, they're um, vulnerable to that kind of regen if the um, site isn't kept controlled. So, yeah, so yeah. now we're working together with the team, with the Inspector of Ancient Monuments for the area to try and develop a proper uh, programme that we can approach that site and clear it again, but then keep the management ongoing and keep it cleared. In the same way that um, within the Norfolk and Suffolk area, I build on work set in place by you and our conservation manager to um, have an annual vegetation control on all um, the scheduled monuments in the Norfolk and Suffolk area. So, and I've also been going down to um, engage more with the rest of my beat. I go North Norfolk right down to Kent. So, and working together with the beat teams down in Kent to uh, revise management plans for scheduled monuments down there. They, they're actually, they've been really good at keeping on top of uh, clearance, but it could always be better. <laughs> so, yeah, but I'm starting to think about um, better kind of low cost ideas for um, interpretation as well. Ways to guide people about with sort of low cost embedded Google Maps, for example, that they could download and take out on their phone into the areas of the forest where we have the worst reception in the world in you know, parts of Thetford Forest. So, um, a way to guide people about and to get those opportunities of um, getting them to visit some of our amazing um, Bronze Age burial mounds and wonderful sites that um, we're keeping open so beautifully. So, now it's time to make get people to go and look at them. As you say, what's the point of opening them all up and nobody's going to go and see them as well. Thank you. And I wonder, Matt, if we might be able to go to you, because I know you do a lot of work um, managing, managing heritage assets, ensuring their visibility. But I remember an inspiring talk that you gave at, a, I think it was a previous CIFA, CIFA conference about managed decline as well. I know we're talking about opportunities, but there's opportunities in in that way of management that you've been working on as well, isn't there? But talk about other things if you if you want to. Uh, yeah, I'm not allowed to talk about managed decline, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> I've been handed a three-line whip. Um, so uh, rather than that, I, I thought uh, one of the, the the first forest plan, we've been talking about that and as the most important milestone in terms of new woodland creation, is getting in there early. Um, and it's about um, whether you're an archaeological surveyor providing the, the information, um, or your local authority providing advice. Um, but that first new woodland creation plan is, is an important milestone in the, the, the life of that land or that, that forest and woodland. So uh, at that point, you're, you're sorting out the, the, the best ways to protect uh, heritage features, uh, best ways or suggestions for best ways to conserve significant heritage features. And you're looking to champion and promote ways uh, to present them designated stuff or the most significant heritage features. So there's a real opportunity there to get in early and champion uh, the best bits of the historic environment in terms of uh, public access, interpretation and promotion. Um, and it was something that as we were discussing this, uh, this the, the content of this panel, it suddenly dawned on me because in Scotland, I can go and camp wherever I want. Within reason, obviously, I can't do it in Balmoral, um, but um, open the Scottish Outdoor Access Code makes, makes it free and easy for me to go just about wherever I want. Um, and so, of course, you can do that on the National Forest Estate. You can do that in, in um, publicly funded or grant-funded grant grant woodlands. But in, in, in England um, and in Wales, um, it's a real opportunity to get uh, public access, uh, outdoor access uh, uh, to, to, to significant sites uh, and to promote things like outdoor learning, which maybe I'll be allowed to talk on a bit later, um, uh, but the, the, the place and get people outdoors and enjoying our heritage. So uh, uh, it's the forest plan and that's the way to get in and, and champion the opportunities. Yeah, I'd agree with Matt. I just, I just want to throw in a a bit of a case study in the form of Forestry England's estate. So we've got 250,000 hectares that we manage across the country. Within that, we're just shy of 100,000 known sites and monuments. And I think one quarter of that comes from the high wheel. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for the high woods in, in the South Downs. So thank you for that. Um, but an incredible, an incredible um, array of assets of, of those 100,000, nearly 1,000 of which are designated sites in, in some form or the other. But we're growing. So we, we are actively buying land. We are planting, we are setting that initial 
um, forest plan uh, together. Um, uh, but one site we've just acquired a, 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 of late, has, based on the data that we had, based on the, the initial searches, we identified the archaeological opportunity. We undertook some additional surveys and targeted geophysics or uh, walkover surveys. Um, and we've taken a love, beautiful Iron Age enclosure with associated roundhouses, um, an early medieval metalworking site and a Roman villa out of arable ploughing. And they're now sitting in lovely open space. They'll be managed, they'll be protected. And they're part of the na nation's for national forest estate now where people can go and learn about that. We can incorporate the the interpretation, we are inter incorporating the interpretation and the access to these sites. So um, there's a real thing there of, yeah, I, I, I think we've got an amazing resource in the form of Forestry England, the nation's forests, and we'll keep taking on more estates and more, more land and we'll keep protecting those things in an appropriate way. Imagine, could I bring you in, Sarah? Pass the microphone down. In a policy perspective on all of this, which is a bit dry, but it, it, it is a really important area for communicating to government why heritage is such a valuable part of our environment, is that the opportunity is a force for, for recreation and people's en engagement with, with the countryside and with, with nature. You know, we have the sort of the, the sort of foundation for heritage's inclusion in all of the sort of environmental policy is this 25-year environment plan, which Includes heritage under the guise of in enhancing beauty, heritage, and public engagement. So, it's a very strong narrative that we can give to government about how you know conserving heritage, you know promoting benefits, public engagement, benefits, health and well-being agendas, and everything. So, is really good. So, um, yeah, and I and I think you know for the the public who engage with. The countryside and the, the, the rural environment, they, you know, it, it, it enriches their, you know, the, the forestry estate provides a, a tremendous opportunity to engage with nature. And presentation and interpretation of heritage really gives that, you know, that long durée to understanding the landscape that, that they're, they're enjoying. So I'm you know, it's a win-win. Chrisha, did you want to come in on that? And I was just thinking about um, the fact that, I, that we can get out there and promote it a lot more. We've got so much there. And as Lawrence was just saying, that amazing array of figures there. But, um, but I think it's um, good to sort of like step out and start thinking about focusing on different audiences as well. Because we have quite a lot of focus on our volunteer groups who are already engaged in Thetford. But I've tried to also engage with um, local sort of friendship groups who have formed during COVID and they're just people who aren't particularly interested in heritage but you know interested in getting out and about and doing things. I offered them an archaeological walk and they said yes why not and all came along <laughs> which was great and um, came around a site which had a, a fantastic big moat and a deserted settlement and my, the, the feedback I got at the end of it was people saying I kind of bought the dog walk in here for like about the last 10 years. I've never seen that before, pointing at the massive moat. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I just thought that's great. They all went away, sort of really engaged with it, enjoyed it, and with brief, no previous particular interest in archaeology. So, trying to sort of like get our reach out a bit more. Jill, I wondered if you wanted to talk about well being and access, if, if that's okay. If not, on the spot. Quickly <laughs> thinking. <laughs> looking at looking at my notes in front of me. Yes. Um, well, well, we have a well-being future generations in Wales, which I think is what we're, we're looking at here. Um, and within that, we have different aspects that we should try to um, meet for future generations from a healthy Wales, resilient Wales, you know, uh, cohesive communities and different things. And um, you know, many of our woodland estates um, is in South Wales and it's just in the South Wales valleys. And that has made a significant difference to the setting for those um, residences and the people that live there. And also their, um, the distance for their access to, to open space, which can be often quite challenging and accessible open space. 
and you know, we have all sorts of different things on offer from your usual walks to different bike park whales and different things um, but I think it's sometimes you know, woodlands can also feel quite inaccessible to people I suspect most people that we might encounter in a woodland maybe in a group or with somebody else and it's not often you know people can feel that they can just go off in some of these south wales valleys and other areas walking on their own so i think it's also a part of trying to make these feel that they're visibly accessible um and and, and accessible in many ways that you are welcome here and and it's okay to, to come in different guises and take what you are. And I think sometimes if people have a direct purpose to get to somewhere, um, then uh, whether it that might be a heritage feature, we have not seen, we've got a new heritage feature, shall we go and see it? Um, can we link more to green prescriptions in our woodlands and make it easy? So I think there's so much more um, that we can do. And, and I think, you know, everything is just on the table for that. Thank you. I'm going to pass to Lawrence and then we'll come to you, Matt. Thank you. As you with regards to demographics and ac access to, to people and people's access to the, the historic environment, I would say as well, I was blown away when talking to our national teams that look at demographics and target audiences and things like that, that they, they find it hard to engage older white middle class people with our forests and our key demographics are instagram influencers and um family den builders um but actually i'd argue it's there's a pretty typical audience that the historic environment engages through activities and actually forests forests as a setting that hosts the historic environment and can engage people with the historic environment are a pretty cool and unique space to facilitate that that takes us away from our more traditional sort of public outreach and and typical demographics and audiences that we engage with maybe to you matt i was just going to tell a quick story about uh, a brock that i have on the west coast in atlantic rainforest um i wrote a, bro uh, a blog about it a while back which i urge you to go and read um the the brocks and biodiversity um, it's an uh, unconsolidated structure. Um, it's the, um, the, the focus of a, an outdoor learning resource that we produced uh, a few years back called To Build a Brock, which uh, imagines all the, the, the moments, the key moments in time within the building and subsequent collapse of said brock. I, I knew I'd get into managed decay eventually. <laughs> um, but I asked a, a lichenologist to go and have a look at the brock, thinking about the, the opportunities to blend nature and cultural heritage together. Um, and she crawled all over the structure, uh, and I was thinking that maybe there were, it was going to be a niche habitat for lots of interesting uh, lichens and bryophytes. Uh, and it turned out that it was it was rammed full of the most common uh, lichens and bryophytes you could possibly imagine, but that this was very unusual. Within its wet rainforest environment, it created this sort of dry sun trap for lots of interesting things that she found very boring, but in the context of uh, the, the wider habitat were, were really interesting. So I was able to sell it as a, as a, a niche for biodiversity as well. Um, so the, one of the opportunities, I guess, is this, is this uh, uh, any, any work that we can do that blends uh, natural habitat and cultural heritage together uh, falls on fertile ground when you're, you're in a forest or woodland because they're already thinking about these things. They're already thinking about biodiversity. They've already got ecologists in place. Um, uh, it, it really is fertile ground to think about things like that um, and provide the space, the outdoor place that people can go um, and, and not only connect with nature, but in this case, connect with the Brock and the, the Brock builders uh, of 2000 years ago true opportunity yeah thank you um and you've very nicely moved us into that final final discussion section that we we're going to look at in terms of how the historic environment and natural environment can work together and in a way we're building on the conversation this morning in the good natured progress session i wondered if there's anyone else on the panel who wants to to take the the nature and historic environment forward so can say a little on that because um, I don't do anything in relation to the historic environment unless I can wheedle in the natural environment as well. Um, it's almost like the reason d'etre. So um, it's uh, we have a memorandum of understanding I mentioned before with Cadu and uh, Archaeological Trust, Heneb, uh, the Archaeological Trust as was. And that really is permeated. I mean, I know this is about forestry, but it's permeated all our work across NRW um, and many of the topics we've had today. 
And it means that when we try to do some work, either just um, evidence and, and working out decision making for a site, it's about the historic environment, but it's also about the natural environment or whatever the, the environment is that we're working there. And it's always hand in hand. And the same as if we do any liaison or training days, it will never be um right we're going to train you up on the historic environment and forestry from that perspective only it will always be both perspectives and that has meant that you know we're upskilling and raising awareness um to different people different audiences within the organization actually each time we're doing one we're bringing in about 100 different people um, from across the organization that sometimes are a bit peripheral and so they're raising their awareness about the historic environment in other areas as well and um and, and so what it's meaning is that generally we're sort of slowly and incrementally raising awareness in ways that you wouldn't have expected and the rewards from that are, are, are very good so if i put a reach out um as i have just done um this week because i've got something to report on anybody got any examples of what they've been doing on the historic environment I'm getting good engagement from all sorts of different places um, that's coming back. And I think it's because we're not just saying who's doing something on the historic environment. It's always about historic and natural environment together. Um, and it's those opportunities. So you know, I think I, I like your lying on, on fertile ground. That's a really good way of putting it. And I think the, the other one thing to say is um, perhaps in this context, we're thinking about archaeologists and then foresters and you're either that profession or this profession and, and obviously for myself I'm, I'm sort of like across many sort of di disciplines within the organization where I work on the historic environment but it is amazing to me on how many people are champions and enthusiastic about the historic environment and how can they do more for it in whatever they're doing and um, and they're really keen to engage so I, I know this, although this is a forestry session, many of you might work in across different sectors and things. You know, people are really proud to make their difference. Um, so I think it's good, good opportunities. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jill. We'll go to Krisha and then Lawrence and then we'll go questions in the room. And really quick point to that. Just thinking that the reason that I have such a um, good management going on with monuments down in Kent is down to our wildlife rangers down there who are really, really interested in heritage. So they, they'll they really champion it in the district. So yeah, that complete crossover. Thank you. I, I, I'm just going to go back to threats ever so briefly and just to say that the one threat is talking about the historic environment and the natural environment siloed. and. Um, it's one of the biggest issues we have in our whilst well, on the ground not so much but strategically in our organization to be able to better facilitate the historic environment is impossible because they're like oh the historic environment is this and the natural environment is this and the natural environment's important and we'll do the bare minimum that we have to do for the historic environment but legally um and the rest will will try and do nice to do's and things like that so th there is a risk of not talking about them as one and the same um, there's some work, Hannah mentioned it this morning about the outdoor cultural heritage capital work that we're doing. And I'm really hopeful that that will offer an opportunity to better intertwine that discussion and demonstrate the benefit, <coughs> excuse me, the benefits that the historic environment bring to the natural environment as well. Um, right, on that note, I am going to do some questions. Uh, I'll say if anyone's got any questions for the panel on opportunities, um, I will go around. But also while we're doing that, we have another poll. So if you are happy to fill that in while we're doing that as well, that'd be great. But any questions for opportunities? While Lawrence is walking around, I'll just let you know, we'll have about five minutes for questions and then we're going to invite Rob Sutton from Cotswold Archaeology to sum up the session for us. Hi, um, so I'm Grace. Um, I'm HER officer for Perth and Kim Ross. Um, and part of that role is providing historic environment advice um, for forestry consultations. And I think what I'm saying here will kind of be an opportunity and a threat rolled into one. But while you're we talking about access, um, a site came to, I'm right to roam in Scotland, a site that came to mind was Comarwood Dun. Um, it was a dun in a forest that was essentially rediscovered through forestry work. Um, you would chat to the locals and they all tell you stories about how they would, they'd play at this site and they never, it wasn't in the historic environment record or anything. So it was brilliant that it was rediscovered as part of um, the forestry work. Um, but I, I got a tour to it through the local heritage society and it struck me that 
it was you had to go through all these lock gates, you're going all these windy forestry paths, and there was only um, signage for it practically at the site. So there's access to it, but it's not actually very accessible. Um, and part of you know my role is we, we were, that's the advice we provide for these sites is you've got an opportunity here to make these sites accessible, it's in your favor. Um, but that's the problem. You can't, uh, from a planning, from th this advisory perspective, we can't enforce this advice that we're giving um, within the, the forestry. It's not like planning where we can slap a condition on it and then monitor the works to make sure they're doing um, what we've asked them to. Um, and it does sometimes feel like historic environment consultations for advice, you're identified as a stakeholder and it feels like a box ticking exercise. Um, so they get a polygon data set going, going back to polygons. Um, and they don't actually engage with the data, they get the polygons, they'll slap the uh, forestry clients or just put a buffer on that data without taking your advice of saying you need to go and do walkover surveys because this point, there's a data limitation here. It's been, it was surveyed by Royal Commission in the 1960s. You know, this data is 60 years old now. The, the, the location data is a four figure grid reference. You need to go out and actually survey it so that that buffer is is appropriate. So. I think my question there is how how can we enforce advice that we're giving to these um, you know all these woodland creation schemes um, in, under current legislation because there's not a lot of leverage um, to, to follow it up. So that was a very long winded. <laughs> I, I think I can probably take some of that, but it'd be an England perspective rather than a Scotland one, I'm afraid. So um, within Forestry Commission um, in England, um, Lawrence and I when we joined. Forestry Commission, we were two people, um, but since then, in my part of the business, we've been able to grow. We're now up to 8.2 full-time equivalent, and we are working with our forestry teams, our area teams. We are making sure when advice comes in, if it's UKFS compliant, that it is being followed, that it goes in when grant applications come in. People are gathering the information, the advice they need to. We are, we're trying to do that enforcement our, ourselves, and we'll have to see how successful we are um, but I guess that guidance that I mentioned um, as well is is a way to try and get people to realize really early it really stresses you've got to think about the historic environment at the earliest point um, I think as was being stressed in the session this morning if you think about it right from the start it becomes an opportunity not not a constraint um, the, the, the guidance tries to be guidance but it also stresses opportunities in in there so um, not going to like this, Grace. Sorry, you can't enforce advice. It's advice. Yeah, um, you can you can strongly suggest, or you can, um, um, it, yeah, it's it, it's advice. So in the case of Comar Wood, it's a really funny one. Um, we did we we discovered it, we felled it, we excavated it. As part of the contract, we ensured that there were two early career opportunities. Um, so we tried to tick all the right boxes. It was uh, a fantastic discovery. Got good dates. I got interesting discovery of, of, of the use of timber within this dry stone structure um, published properly and then the locals want to have it interpreted and an access driven to it it's in the middle of nowhere and so from a national strategic cultural heritage perspective i'm saying no right don't do anything with this site we've done our bit right well now it's scheduled we'll try and manage it in the future but it's not one i would consider um as uh, appropriate for presentation and interpretation so it does just go to show it's all about communication and collaboration in which case you know I'd, I'd have been able to explain that to oh I have explained it to the local community who are not having any of it but I would have explained it to the local authority you guys who would have understood that yeah okay you see where I'm coming from because it's it's too expensive to drive a path out there and, and and to maintain and then when you get there it's a lovely view but the site's pretty rubbish so on that bombshell any further questions <laughs> I guess one thing we have to bear in mind is um, landowner perspectives as well. We might advise advice, we might advise access, but that may not fit with their overall plans. Hi, hi, hi thank you. My name is Sarah Jane. I'm generally don't understand or know this. What, if anything, are you doing, any or of your organisations, in terms of the production of traditional materials for traditional skills? Where is all the wood? that we're producing going. Well, we've surely got a lot of mileage if we produce the right type of wood for building maintenance, building skills, another side to heritage and use of the landscape and creating that connection. I generally don't know what we do with the wood we produce. 
in this country. And say who would is it the right kind of wood? Take that one. We'll very, very brief. We produce very poor wood in terms of the productive conifer. So uh, you'll be wiping your bum with it. Uh, you'll be uh, making fence posts and paper. Um, but we'll import anything of building quality because we grow timber too quickly, basically, because of the climate. Um, so that's that's the, the bottom line. Um, and lots of things. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the, uh, but there's lots of traditional skills and things like that. It's, it's all part of, um, I guess, forestry. And then in terms of um, uh, uh, helping things like thatching, I suppose. And, and I'm, I'm not so out of my depth. I'm going to pass it on. I don't know what I'm talking uh, about. I would say thing that we don't manage many of our forests traditionally. We have small dedicated coppicing groups that's led by people that are going to work on that. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one. There's some work to be done there around the cultural heritage of, of forestry as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> Just thinking, well, like we have um, different types of silver cultural systems in different areas of the country. So, say down in um, parts of Kent, we have lots of chestnut coppice, but um, in Thetford Forest, it's all productive conifer plantations. So, it does vary what of, what uses our wood is put to different regions of the country. Got... Amazingly, forestry is quite traditional in some aspects. Like you see somebody planting trees, like in some ancient photo, and they do it exactly the same way now. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. I'm just. We've probably got time for one last question. So, if you want to link up with the Welsh response at another time, or um, I was... you've, you've talked about the opportunity of opening up assets for public engagement and awareness, um, and we've also talked about how. Um, earthworks in particular have been protected by by coverage um so what measures are you putting in place to ensure that those assets that were hidden and have you know survived through through their you know inaccessible woodland cover that are now being opened up and we are promoting access um what measures are you taking to ensure that there isn't any in you know uh, inadvertent impact uh, through antisocial behavior or, or or the such um are you do you promote condition surveys at the beginning and then have management plans for 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 you know for X amount of time? How do how do you um, keep an eye on that? Well, um, we do have management plans, so um, yeah, a lot the time where we've got cases of natural regen on sites, so there have been changes in woodland management over time. So big forestry teams have changed or had our districts rejoin and, and the site has gone from one district to another but yeah we try and stay on top of it as much as possible and keep um sites managed on at least an annual basis so particularly with our scheduled monuments of cutting vegetation but also with um undesignated assets as well and um, we have i think that's part of engaging with the forest plan as well so making sure that that land is designated as open and that goes on to our sub-compartment database so that that land is marked out as open land and then carrying on engaging with the beat teams to make sure that they're doing that work and keeping it as it should be. And that's for the sort of the public estate, isn't it? In terms of sort of private schemes or schemes that are open to private landowners, something that's been recognised with the development of the new environmental land management that we are actually our, our costs we're trying to get historic environment integrated better into those woodland management plans that inform those funded programs that, that private owners are taking and i think there's plans for an introduction of a new supplement that basically will provide some additional funds resources to the, the owners to sustain those outcomes as well which will be uh, you know for an agreed amount of time with, with dedicated resources so uh, it's been it's been recognized in the new scheme I'll just say and mention again the guidance that was published today that at the moment doesn't make reference to the supplement that's coming, but the first update will to that guidance will be a link to that supplement when it's when it's available so landowners know they can they can get that additional funding if if they so choose. So we're now going to pass over to to Rob Rob Sutton from Cotswold Archaeology just to conclude for us. Thank you, David. Um, 
a, a realization three minutes into my brief that I'm a terrible note taker. Um, and I've written 17 pages to summarize. No, I haven't, of course, I haven't. That's a, a couple of pages here. Um, and what I'm going to do very quickly and hopefully relatively simply across the next two or three minutes is obviously just try to draw together some of the themes we've been discussing to see if I can summarize it in some kind of way and maybe actually draw out some maybe some actions uh, that, that might actually influence our behaviors and discussions that go beyond and after today. Um, and we started with, with, with the, the fact that the most heavily regulated land use in the UK was the forestry, and then it wasn't. So that was a great start, really, wasn't it? Um, and, and one of the things I'm going to take away, which is, oh, it's coming, more trees are on the way. Um, which does sound threatening, doesn't it? Let's be honest with you, even if that might be within the opportunities section. Um, and through the, the management, restoration, and creation process, there was there was quite a focus, to be honest with you, on, on the creation um, and how properly informing design um, is going to bring about the correct projects and the right solutions to, to manage in the historic environment through these forestry projects. But again, let, let's be honest with, with us that work in, in planning, and, and, and most of us do in this room, um, unsurprisingly, access to good quality data is everything. It's the golden thread. Without that, any discussions regarding informed decision making is, is it's just not going to happen. Um, uh, we, we then managed to draw upon a, a quick summary on the, the, the Tree Roots project and, and the realization, again, if I'm honest with you, not unsurprisingly, um, that we have very limited quantifiable evidence on that, that particular project and, and that, oh, good Lord, I wrote this, very much rooted in anecdote. But um, I don't think anybody said that, it's just my terrible notes again. Um, but again, and then moving on through those threats and processes, we've got the climate ad adaptation projects and the greater realization actually of the threats and picking up on the too wet, too dry scenarios and, and the examples of the wildfires in Wales. And if a tree fell down in a World Heritage Site, damaging a scheduled monument and no one was around to hear it, Icomos would. They most definitely would. Um, but then maybe continuing a theme beyond buried archaeology and, and, and earthworks and recognising the very real scenario of changing historic landscape character and, and Lawrence feeling that that nah, doesn't matter, does it? Because <laughs> we've got that dynamic shift and change in landscape. But the realisation that actually, again, going back to that theme of informed design, there are clearly places within our landscape where actually there is much more scope and capacity to accept those changes and making sure that we're focusing on the right one. Again, picking up on some of the woodland creation projects and triggering the need for improved guidance to understand and manage those key issues but to improve access to historic environment data sets, developing Shine to work with the forestry projects, incorporating map regression via AI. And don't leave that hanging. I need to know more about that. <laughs> oh, that sounds really good. And bringing LiDAR data in to improve understanding of potential issues, again, informing early planning. But then we shifted the conversation a little bit towards improving training to reframe the dialogue and advice to ensure the very real differences from woodland creation compared to such a development, to make sure that we're not bringing forward some of those slightly tired and uh, cliched advices about that we've been used to managing development-led projects into conversations about forestry, which are very different. And then picking up on some of the matters regarding uh, resourcing and the uh, and uh, th things that I learned today, if I'm brutally honest with you, about the uh, the records on historic assets held within your GIS systems that are, are not replicated across into the HER, and some of your data sets that have been taken from the HER from a decade ago, and they are being used to inform decision making, and how how you all recognise that that is a real issue, but actually trying to tackle that is a real difficulty with the resourcing pressures. And we opened up to the floor at that point, and we got some good examples about the value that comes from the NMP records. And guess that golden thread's coming through again, but even that needs to be carefully curated because that's a point in time data. And actually some of those things might be informing decision-making when actually the archeology span is long gone. It's long been plowed up. And again, a, a golden thread for me personally to take away from this and it's something that I always need to remind myself about it, that some of the best preserved archeology span 
in the UK survives in our woodlands. Because, and if you don't think I'm going to quote you about this, ploughing is killing archaeology in England. Oh, I'll put that one in my pocket. <laughs> I work on lots of solar farm schemes. People might be able to join the dots on that. <laughs> so then we, then we put away all of that bad news, didn't we? But of course we didn't. We dragged them through into working those opportunities to manage those threats and maybe opportunities that sit outside some of those threats. So, so following felling and then planting, how careful management can allow for the physical and intellectual, I'll try again, put my teeth in, physical and intellectual access to monuments and earthworks. Embedding archaeology, the heritage storytelling, into the narrative of the wider green and, uh, and accessible landscapes. Again, we recognise that the unmanaged regen post felling being a key issue, but sharing that great projects at a site, site by site, monument by monument level can improve access, but that's the start of the process, because there's the opportunity that we can then bring in via more interpretation and more engagement, digitally accessible engagement as well, and getting that engagement with traditional audiences, but also brand new participants. The forestry estate really does allow for greater reach. And on that matter of audience, I thought that was a really interesting contradiction of the way in which some of your colleagues think about what are your traditional audiences to what many of us would think about uh, audiences for, for the historic environment. Um, and just picking up on something I wrote here, Matt isn't allowed to talk about adaptive release since a wild camping incident at Balmoral home. Doesn't quite follow, but anyway. Um, but, um, <laughs> I think the, 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 what, what quickly followed on from that, again, was the recognition of the 100,000 monuments and assets within the forestry estate in England. I mean, that is it's an exceptional number to get your head around because when we're talking about opportunities, let's be honest with you, when a threat is resourcing, you've got to get your priorities right. Because you know, I've got a great idea, everybody. I'm going to manage the 100,000 assets better. Sorry, guys, nonsense. And that then got picked up on some of the points you were discussing then, Matt, about is that the site that we spend our money on? Is that the one that we spend tens of thousands of pounds on improving access to and then have to manage for decades to come forward? But I guess I'm going to just pick up on two final points in the opportunities here, which, which struck home for me really a little bit. And that's the way in which cultural heritage and the human interventions in the landscape create that juxtaposition, unnatural habitats, given these curious, maybe unique biodiversity opportunities, and how that, as an opportunity, can break down the silos, because we can have our engaged foresters and rangers acting as the champions of the historic environment, and that can feed into those engagements with new audiences where everybody becomes champions for our forests and the historic environment. That was about right. I think I, think I missed something, but thank you. Am I on? Yeah. Thank you so much. That was a brilliant wrap up. And uh, yeah, loved it. Big grin. Um, just leads me to thank you all very much for attending the session. Hopefully, we've planted a few seeds of ideas and um, you'll be branching out to uh, get involved with your. Oh, I'll stop it now. But also, <laughs> leave it off. Oh, yeah. Um, just leaving me also to say thank you so much for our fantastic panel and the knowledge and experience that you brought to the, the discussion this afternoon and thank you all very much. <laughs>